now. Okay, uh, so everyone, thank you very much for joining us for our, our next session of Global Thoughts. Uh, we have Kevin Locke here, and I'll let him uh, introduce himself to you. Uh, but I do want to say how I met Kevin, and it was uh, in Havana several years ago. And I have the picture here, and you can see how um, you can see Kevin in action here. Whoops, so I got this. There, there we go. You can see uh, Kevin uh, spoke to uh, to a number of Cuban children, and he was a hit, as you can see. Um, it, it was wonderful to see just the interaction uh, between him and, and the students. You can see Kevin there smiling because he's very passionate about what he does. But you can see the, the students here smiling, and for me, that that really is what international education is about. You know, we've all talked about yeah, you know, the STEM and you know, and all these other different things. But basically, what international education comes down to for me is these connections and the humanity and just solidarity and, and, and friendship really so some people may say well Tom you're an originist okay great I, I make no apologies for that but I think that is really what this is all about and if you see like um, if you saw the vice presidential debate uh, from a few days ago that's what Kamala Harris said you know the, the, the a really, our, it's all about relationships with other countries that's that's global leadership and I think what we're seeing here in this picture is one of my favorites, by the way, and it's just a great way of communicating. And I'll let, I'll let Kevin explain what he does. Um, uh, he can certainly do a much better job than, than I can, but I wanted to start off this dis discussion, this presentation with this picture. Like I said, it's one of my favorites and for me, captures for me what international education is all about. So without further ado, Kevin, um, I'll turn it over to you so that you can uh, you introduce yourself and, and Get the ball rolling. Okay, thank you, Tom. Yeah, it's really great to uh, be here with you all and to uh, be able to share some uh, some air time on the on the program Global Thoughts. And I I have been really blessed over the course of the last several decades, since uh, maybe the late '70s, to have traveled. I think all told, 97 countries. You know, as a performing performing artist, and and uh, I know that. Uh, you know, we, we all have different identities, but I think probably because of my travels and then I'm also a member of the Baha'i faith. So that's really my, my, my primary identity as a, a world citizen. So that's how I see myself. And uh, it's really been a blessing to go all over and to, to share some of the uh, folk arts or traditional arts from here in North America. And then I found that because of the universal themes that uh, folk arts portray, they have validity anywhere amongst all people because you know, over time and all the different communities through the world, then uh, the different populations create these uh, uh, forms of expression. It could be music, it could be dance, it could be uh, different kind of crafts or whatever, yeah, but these are passed on intergenerationally and they're called folk arts or traditional arts. And I think what happens is that, is that over time, they come more and more to reflect universal themes. And so these universal themes do that, just that they, they accentuate and support and just really uh, 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 portray the oneness of the human family. You know, like the, our innate nobility, all those things that make us human. And so I think that photo that you chose there is pretty good because it, it just shows, you know, the engagement. I like to, you know, whenever I, you know, like places like I go naturally in 97 countries, you have to uh, be able to find ways to communicate in ways that transcend language. So you have to do things more uh, interactively or uh, with participation. Or participatory so that's you know I I could use a translator and I did a little bit but it's better just to get everybody engaged uh, and that I think that's the best that's the best possible way so I had a great time I think I was in in mostly in Santa Clara and all the different little communities around Santa Clara kind of the middle midsection of uh, the island of uh, Cuba but then we did we did several things right around Havana, that's where I met Tom over there. But I've been doing these uh, 
most of my life and I, I just got a, a start early on and uh, in our uh, community at Standing Rock, you know, we have, uh, we have all these, uh, we've had all these traditions ongoing, albeit that through most of the last century, everything had to go underground because of the active uh, suppression and repression of the uh, federal government and, you know, the different uh, powers that be that were tried to suppress all of these uh, traditional art forms, culture, language, everything else. But still, you know, we had those those cultural warriors that kept everything going. So I was really uh, so blessed to be a beneficiary of that uh, courage that they had. And uh, of course, I was always interested in those things as well. And uh, like I said, I've, I have been able to travel extensively. Initially, I think the first, one of the first international trips I had was, uh, we went to uh, on a two month tour to nine countries in Africa. And that was in 1980. And uh, that was through the USIS, US, US Information Service. Because uh, during the, uh, there was a phase there. I th it was, I think, initiated during the uh, Kennedy JFK administration. Then, it, then it was, uh, there was co continuity. But these are the great society programs. You probably know some of them that are ongoing, such as maybe, uh, you know, uh, Peace Corps, or there's Head Start. There's other ones too. And then one of them was um, is Arts America, Arts America. And then I think the later on that kind of, it, the, the, the purpose of it didn't change, but then it got somehow transmuted or transformed into this, an agency of the uh, US Information Service. So the whole overarching theme behind that was um, diplomacy or um, you know, just, just diplomacy through the arts. So the uh, artists, you know, performing artists became uh, goodwill ambassadors. And one of the main uh, proponents of that was uh, the world famous jazz trumpeter, his name was uh, Dizzy Gillespie. A lot of people may have heard of him or know of him, but he was, uh, he was probably the most uh, active and famous pro proponent of that whole movement and uh, creating, you know, oneness and, and goodwill through the arts. And so, uh, so I, I was, you know, I, so I did a lot of work with, it, with them all over the world, different tours. And, and uh, it's just such a fantastic movement. And in fact, I, I, the most, the last time I, I left home really was, I was in Switzerland in February. And then uh, when I was in Switzerland towards the end of February, that's when that pandemic broke out in Northern Italy and they started to do a lot of travel restriction. But I did manage to, to get out, get out of Europe. <laughs> but, but since I got out of Europe, my big trips have been to the bathroom. So that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, okay, Tom, is, is that uh, is there anything else introductory I should say? Just un unmute yourself. I, I'm on mute. I always do that. Sorry about that. Um, my finger got a little antsy, but I, I just wanted to uh, present this name to everyone here because I'm almost positive no one knows who this young lady is. Her name is Autumn Peltier. Uh, she's, I think, member of the uh, Anishinaabe tribe in, in, in Canada. Um, but the thing I, the reason I, 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 I was attracted to this story, and I, I won't lie, I only discovered it by accident is you know, she received no none of the media attention that Malala Yousafzai had, had or Greta Thunberg. So I guess my question to you, Kevin, is you know, uh, why, why is that? Because this is a really young, uh, a 14 year old, and she was arguing, advocating for water rights for her tribe there in Canada, a very legitimate complaint, I mean, uh, um, campaign. But we, we don't hear anything. Uh, so my question to you, Kevin, is uh, why is that? Well, it's basically because uh... Maybe she's better known in Canada, but in the United States, you know, it's um, that it, it's still the overarching mindset is is to is to be um, oblivious to anything indigenous in the United States. So the you know the average person in the United States, the uh, whole theme of ind indigeneity or indigenous presence is, is is something that never 
enters people's consciousness. I've come to realize that. So, um, but the United States is one of the few places where that happens. You know, Canada, even though the indigenous population, I think is less than 10% of the population. Uh, I think that, you know, like in, in Canada, the indigenous, overall indigenous population is not much more than in the United States, but you have to realize that Canada is just a, uh, uh, is a, just a, less than a tenth the population of the U.S. and the the entire immigrant population of Canada just hugs the U.S. border. So basically, Canada is just a whole indigenous territory, geographically speaking, and uh, so it's 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 hard for people to uh, not to you know when they think of Canada, they think of aside from just the that that thin veneer of, of uh, urban um, that like as it hugs the US border, it's basically an, an indigenous country. Same thing with Mexico and uh, you know Central America, South America. So it's it, it, people, even though they, they don't they don't maybe necessarily want to think about it, but it's hard for them to avoid it. But in the US somehow it just goes completely under the radar of most people that I found. That's my that's my realization. Yeah. So that that's kind of a long answer. <laughs> I don't know if that's if that's a good answer, but I think it's uh, it just tends to go unnoticed. Anything indigenous tends tends to go unnoticed in the U.S. But I was looking at my 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 feed on my news feed today, and I saw there is a really nice letter uh, from this um, this uh, indigenous lady from uh, uh, from Ecuador, in which she wrote to the uh, uh, nine leaders of the nine countries in. The Amazon region and the leaders throughout the world. It's a very well stated letter. Uh, uh, I could probably uh, send it, send that to you, Tom. I should have sent that earlier. But, yeah, uh, yes, Kevin, please do, and I'll I'll be happy to send that to everyone. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'll also in a minute I'm going to cut off here so I can get the link, uh, and I'll send that to you about Autumn uh, Peltier so you can learn a little bit more about her because she really is an amazing young woman. And I have a couple other links I'll send to you as well. Yeah, okay, I'm sending it to you now. That okay, thanks. Nice. Yeah. There, we're not to you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but it's really well stated because uh, she really uh, she really sums up the um, she she sums up the uh, kind of an indigenous perspective on this whole theme of uh, yeah. of the um, of the uh, climate crisis. Uh, and you know it, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a um, it's not really a complex uh, statement or sentiment, but you know what she what she what she sums up, and the same thing with this peltier girl, is that uh, the relationship is the that the uh, that you know the, the the physical world and the spiritual world are not separate from each other. So the all the idea is that everything in the world is. <clears throat> a physical manifestation of a spiritual reality so that uh, the, uh, the, the, it's all the handiwork of one creator, just one creator. And so it's just that everything in this, and of course, the physical world we can experience with our senses, but then the spiritual worlds are beyond our ken, they're beyond the, our, our ability to grasp. But yet if we understand this principle and we come to the realization that the same um, laws operate throughout the entirety of creations, since it's all the handiwork of one creator. So then um, the idea is that everything in this world is a counterpart to something in the spiritual worlds. And so I think this is something that was really misunderstood initially by the uh, immigrant populations. You know, they, 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 uh, they mischaracterize the indigenous people as, uh, as being uh, like, they worship nature or they, they deify nature, but it's, a, it's totally not that at all. It's totally not that. What it is is that you know, everything in nature is a reflection and a repository of divine attributes. So it's not like you're gonna worship that mountain, but that mountain just embodies divine or heavenly attributes of, of like maybe majesty or grandeur, loftiness or something like that. You don't worship the ocean but the ocean just represents, as, you know, this, this is as close as we can get to maybe physical or spiritual realities of like, like um, vastness, 
or limitlessness. You get the idea though. So everything in, in nature is this way. And so this lady from the Amazon the article I sent you, Tom, she she reflects on this. And you know, the, the and she speaks of the earth as a, as the mother. Now in, in our language, our local language where I'm from, we say uh, grandmother, Uchimaka, grandmother earth. It's just because it's it's more honorific than mother. So it's just, you know, it's, it, it just identifies her uh, holiness and antiquity a little bit more succinctly than mother. So that's why they say grandmother, grandmother earth. But it just, it just kind of conveys that deep honor, that deep respect. And that, uh, you know, of course, the relatedness that we have with all of creation. So that article, she reflects on that and it expresses it very well. I think it's very, 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 very well, very good expression of that. But uh, yeah, so this is kind of the theme of, that this Autumn Peltier will address. And she's from a little community that's called Wukumakam, or it's on, uh, what does it call it? Manitoulin Island. It's, in, it's an island not too far off the shore in the uh, Great Lakes area, I think kind of close to uh, Sudbury, Ontario, but it's off. And that's where they really keep their language and culture pretty strong out there too, in that area, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry, I just uh, sent a couple links to make sure everyone um, can see the link uh, to, to Alton Peltier. And then also the link to the letter that you just sent me, uh, uh, Kevin. Oh, so good. that um, so that you, get, you can at least uh, uh, read and, and just catch up on that. Good, good. Um, yeah, you know, uh, the other day, you know, speak going to Cuba. Uh, Kevin had mentioned to me uh, something that was really, really interesting, which I didn't know about. Um, it was about the um, uh, the Mikosuki tribe and how they were not recognized in the United States. Could you speak a little bit about that, Kevin, and, and, and what they did? Oh, yeah, I, I just kind of mentioned that in passing since you spent so much time in, in, uh, in Cuba. But anyway, uh, you know, years ago, years ago, I, um, I went down, I was invited, I was in the late 70s, I was invited to uh, perform at their uh, uh, arts festival at uh, Mikasuki. It's a small community. It's just like 40 miles west of uh, Miami on that uh, Tamiami Trail. So it's near a place called Four, uh, 40 Mile Bend on that little road out there. But anyway, uh, uh, maybe historically, some of the uh, folks are aware that, you know, the, um, the, uh, during the uh, uh, slave era, era of slavery, uh, a lot of people who were enslaved, uh, uh, they sought asylum and refuge in Florida because uh, Florida was all indigenous people during that time. And, uh, you know, the, during the uh, Jackson era, the, uh, the uh, Jackson tried to remove all the indigenous people out of that part of the United States. But then um, uh, a lot of them just didn't remove, did, were not removed, and they just migrated further south into what's now Florida, you know, the, uh, Florida. And so then um, they set up their communities and then and then a lot of uh, people were enslaved. They found that they were uh, welcome and they were able to set up their communities there amongst the native people, Indian people there in Florida. And so this caused a lot of anguish in the United States and especially the, uh, the con uh, Confederate slaveholding states. And so they appropriated a lot of money to exterminate the native population. And so there were three lar pretty uh, large wars that were fought. Uh, they call the Seminole Wars at different periods, you know, when, a, when they could raise enough funds to send uh, troops down there. But anyway, uh, uh, that's kind of a long story, but uh, the, not all of the people, indigenous people were wiped out or removed, although many were removed to Oklahoma, but uh, there were basically two linguistic groups that remained in Florida. And uh, one of them are the Muscogee, you know, they live up around Lake, Lake Okeechobee in Florida, a little community of Brighton, the Muscogee speakers. And then there's another one, the uh, uh, Mikasuki, but their language they call Hijiti, Hijiti. And, and so then uh, 
there is a real, real ultra conservative faction. And that's the group that split off and became the Miccosukee tribe of, of Florida. And, and they, uh, you know, they, they, they didn't, they didn't, even though they're all the same people, they're all cousins to each other. They didn't join the Seminole tribe because the Seminole tribe are more, they're more, I believe in like acculturation and things like that. But these Miccosukee, they don't, they don't even believe in learning English, you know. <laughs> they're not, they're not too uh, anxious about being colonized. But they, they were not federally recognized these, this group there. And so then, one of the leaders, his name was uh, Buffalo Tiger. He was not able to get federal recognition. So they chartered a plane. They flew down to Havana, and they met with Fidel Castro. And Fidel right away, boy, he, he gave him the green light. He signed the document that gave them uh, 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 international status recognition as a sovereign nation. And he was, uh, he was uh, approaching like North Korea, so, uh, Soviet Union and other, other so-called communist states to get a huge uh, support for their uh, recognition as a sovereign nation. And anyway, before I got too far along, you know, the US government, uh, they, they they re relented, they gave in <laughs> their position. And so they granted the federal recognition to the Miccosukee. So they are the, 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 the they're the most like, they're the most culturally conservative uh, ethnicity, indigenous ethnicity in North America, but they're like the last ones to receive uh, federal recognition. So it's kind of funny. Is that the story you, you yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It, it is because it's it's something you know. I know Cuba well, and I, it's something I think Fidel was happy to do because yeah. you think to to stick it to uh, to to the U.S. government. Yeah. So it, it's it's there's a lot of history there. I I I learned a lot. So thank you for for sharing that. Uh, yeah. They um, have a they have a, if you go to the the uh, the like the little museum there at Mikasuki Village, they've got all the photos and little article about it. it's pretty funny yeah yeah uh, now, uh, speaking of history now um uh I, I'll, I'll post this up in a minute but you know kevin had posted something on facebook which i thought was really interesting uh explaining the difference between an indigenous flute and a native american flute um yeah, yeah okay. so could, could you uh, uh describe that a little bit kevin yeah yeah i can yeah the um what happened was that, um, you know, over time, uh, there, you know, there's, especially like where I'm from, there's all these different genres of music that cover the full spectrum of human expression. And then, uh, of course, just like every other culture in the world, they, we have these uh, kind of like love songs or, you know, uh, romantic themes that could be good, could be bad, could be ugly, but, you know, just expresses all those all those uh, romance themes. And that genre of music is very, uh, is very aberrant. It's very different and distinctive from other genres of music. But those are the kind of songs that were played on the flute, on, to, on the traditional flute. And so the flutes, you can find them there in museums all over the world. You know, I've been, you know, like to Edinburgh or to Frankfurt or Paris, anywhere, but during the, early, I suppose even 1700s, 1800s, these uh, examples of flutes were collected and they're in these collections all over the world. And so this was something that was going along. And so they, these are all vocal compositions that are instrumentalized on the flute. And so it's a long-standing tradition here in North America. But then uh, because of the act of repression and punishment of all expression of traditional culture by the, uh, by the US, the, uh, this flute music kind of began to uh, began to die out during the reservation period. But being at the age that I am, when I was younger, I got to hear a lot of these uh, elders and there were very few flute players that I remember, but all these old time singers, they knew those songs, they, you know, these vocal compositions. And so that's how I got encouraged and started on this. And then around 1980, I began to hear these flutes and I, I even got a hold of one. I tried to play it. I couldn't play it. I didn't know what the notes were. Couldn't play any, any kind of music on it. And then I, I found out there's a guy, his name is um, Michael Graham Allen. He lives down in Tucson. 
And he was, uh, he's a white guy, he's a, I think German American or something like that. But anyway, he, uh, he's interested in flutes and he started making the traditional tune flutes, but then he found out nobody could play them. There's no, they weren't, people weren't comfortable playing them. So then he came, he, he made all kinds of flutes. So then he, 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 uh, he realized there's a real beautiful scale. It's from a Japanese instrument called shakuhachi. And there's a, there's a certain era of shakuhachi. You know, there's many different shakuhachi tunings, but this, he got one from the 19th century. It's called melodic scale. So then he made, he invented the Native American flute around 1980, and he put the Japanese scale on there. And then uh, they started marketing these. A Navajo man named Carlos Nakai made recordings that went platinum, millions of copies. Pretty soon, these recordings are in all the gift shops, like in Yosemite, Yellowstone. And pretty soon, like if you, any of you, when you type that in there, Native American flute, you're going to find thousands of, of hits on there, like there, you know, people will make them, do recordings, everything like that. But they're not, have nothing to do with the indigenous uh, tradition. It's <laughs> but everybody thinks they do. In fact, you know, any kind of thing you see in the uh, media, like Hollywood or whatever, whenever they want to do uh, some kind of uh, ambiance that suggests uh, indigenous North America, they use the Native American flute, which has nothing to do with an existing indigenous musical um, aesthetic. So chew on that for a while. I, I have to tell you, I, I used to listen to Carlos Nakai back in the early 90s. So yeah, he's this, a great this musician. is amazing to hear. <laughs> he's good. Yeah, he's really good. And he is. He's really a, he's a musician. Now, I have nothing against Native American flute. I think it's great. It's, it's, it's invented for improvisation but you can't play indigenous music on it. It doesn't have the, uh, yeah, I mean, you, what can you play with it? You can't, it's not, it's not created. It's created for like the new age movement. That's what it's created for, yeah. Right. Yeah, right. but I think it's great. But the thing is, the only thing that's not good about it is that nobody knows what it is. They don't understand what, the, what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've been, I've been, uh, I, you know, I've been saying this for like 50 years or 40, I guess 40 years since Native American flute was invented, but so far nobody's, they don't want to hear me. <laughs> I'm like the only guy on the planet that's saying this. <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's amazing, because, but I think it goes back to what you said earlier, uh, Kevin, it's just that these are issues that are not really in the conscience of many Americans, you know. No, they, no, no. Uh, so I think people, they just don't know. They, they, they look at it and say, okay, great. Yeah. Not really distinguishing between that and, and the original. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Boy, that's something else. I, that, I'm still blown away because like I said, I, I have a couple of well, cassettes back in the 90s and I enjoyed listening to them. I had no idea about this it's background good. history. That, that's amazing. Yeah. It's just interesting. It's really good, good music. But you know, today of course is uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. Yes. Yeah. Or it could also be Columbus Day, I think, depending on where you are. Yeah. No. But uh, some of the states decided to, uh, you know, opted to so celebrate Indigenous uh, Peoples Day. Yeah. 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 It, it, it should be. They just, you know, we, uh, that's how we for, refer to it here in New York. It's, it's Indigenous Peoples Day. Oh, you know, yeah. When, yeah. I, when I do a, a, uh, an orientation session to students, if I'm in Cuba, when they arrive, I, I, in a way, it's tongue in cheek. I said, look, we don't want you to, to succumb to the Christopher Columbus effect. That, that mm -hmm. means you go somewhere and then you want to, you, you don't care what you see. You have to bring your own baggage, your own way of thinking and, and doing things and impose it on everyone else. Yeah. Um, in fact, I, I mentioned that to someone here because we're, I'm, I'm, in, I'm engaging a little bit in some politics here and I, I'm starting to regret it. Uh, uh, because of the political climate that we live in. But, yeah. but that's some of the things I'm trying to say to people. I said, look, okay, you have to understand the area that you're visiting, engage it, stop imposing mm -hmm. on it. Yeah. And I think in, in, in study abroad, we still see that. I, I've been very critical about some of my colleagues in that. Um, but that's a topic for another day. You know, yeah. Some of my colleagues here, I don't criticize you, but some other people in the field in yeah, terms yeah. of how they, they do this. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, so I'm, I'm still blown away about Carlos Nakai. That's, and I did put his name there so you can look it up and see for yourself because, he, as Kevin says, he is talented. I just didn't know the background about the instrument that he uses. And he um, knows, too. He knows. Oh, he knows, does. but yeah, but uh, he's one of the people that, that knows the difference, but most of them don't like to say it because. Yeah, of yeah. course. It's... Yeah. <laughs> but even that, you know, the, this guy, uh, the guy that invented the Native American flute is um, Michael Graham Allen. He recently did, did an article in which he explains exactly how he did come about inventing it. Yeah. So. Now, that, that's amazing. That, and that's an area that Amer Americans need to look, learn a little yeah. bit better. Yeah. Um, but going on that, uh, my next question for you, uh, Kevin, is we, we heard in July the Supreme Court uh, made the decision of, of uh, McGirt versus Oklahoma. Yeah. Where they basically said, sorry, folks, but most of Oklahoma is really not part of your land. It's really part of the indigenous inhabitants there. So what what uh, what what are your thoughts on that, Kevin? Uh, what, what, what did you think? Yeah, well, you know, the the. Um... You know, the, the, these are all legal issues that were not fully re resolved. And so then, uh, and I think that, you know, the, they exist everywhere, all over, uh, all over, the, you know, this uh, continent, but it d just depends on the, on the whim of the, uh, of the judiciary, you know, how they, how they decide to uh, legislate it. But I think, you know, Oklahoma is, is, a, is a big test case for a lot of that because, you know, it was, it was really, you know, it was promised as, um, as the, you know, uh, indigenous ownership in perpetuity. And then the documents that, ex that supposedly extinguished those rights were not, uh, uh, you know, they, they, were not, they were not fully or legally executed. So I think that's what's coming up now are the uh, subsequent test cases for that. And I have to admit, I haven't followed that that closely. We have the same things going on everywhere, though. Right. Yeah, everywhere. No, it's it's it's. It, I always do because I do have an interest in it, and it's just to, to brush up my knowledge, really. Yeah. Um. You know, it's, it's funny. My interest really started when I was in seventh grade, a long, long time ago. You know, I learned about Hiawatha, the the Iroquois, you know, and and the creation myth and things like that. But then as I got older, I, I could not find any of this information anywhere. And it really, it, it, it's amazing that that, that has happened. I, but uh, so for, for me, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in learning more and, and just, just try to improve my knowledge about these, uh, these, these historical facts, these historical realities. So it's... Uh, you know, Hiawatha was, uh, you know, he, he, was, uh, he was misappropriated by that uh, Longfellow in that poem. The poem, yeah. yes. Yeah, yes. but you know, Hiawatha, or they say Hiawenta, he was the, uh, one of the first ones to believe in the peacemaker there in New York. And you know, the, 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 this, uh, this holy soul who brought the, uh, the, the commandments, the, the, the golden rule, the laws. And uh, I can send that to you. We did, we've done a, a, a quite a bit of uh, research on these different uh, holy souls, you know, these divine messengers of God who have appeared uh, throughout time here on this side of the planet, this half of the planet, and are really the, the spiritual foundation of all the, all the, all the wonderful uh, gifts of civilization that people have enjoyed here throughout time, throughout, you know, thousands and thousands of years. And so uh, I'll try and get that link to you also, Tom, just in case anybody wants to see it. But yeah, we, we 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 do we spend quite a bit of time on the uh, on the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois people, because you know the peacemaker, uh, they they kept, you know the 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 Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois people, have really kept that that tradition very much alive. They have the uh, they have the even up to today they have the custom of uh, going around frequently to all the different communities to recite. The great law of peace, and they do it, of course, without, without you know, it's all done uh, uh, orally, ver verbally, through memory, and they do it in all the different languages there too. They have the uh, uh, six nations, six nations, and uh, but uh, I don't think Tuscarora is spoken too much anymore. There's just a handful there, but the other ones, I think they're they have quite a few speakers. Yeah. 
No, that's great. You know, there's, there's, uh, and, and Kathleen, you may know this. I think it's in Victor, New York. I, I, I went there last year. There is a little museum there and, and they do, uh, well, they had to cancel this year because of the pandemic, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but they do uh, tours and they do these oral traditions and, and, and talking about the indigenous tradition here. I mm -hmm. think it's very it's fa fantastic. So I have to look it forward is. to next year. Hopefully yeah, yeah. we'll be out of the pandemic. But yeah. there is one thing, uh, yeah, and I read recently uh, in the New York Times, it was about the six, 1680 fight back. And it was about uh, some the indigenous uh, people, I think in New Mexico, fighting back against the, the, the Spanish uh, conquistadors. Mm -hmm. And what I thought was really, not only for the interesting, because I didn't know, uh, but what the way they communicated with each other was they they'd take some rope, tie some knots, and that's how they communicate with each other. And then once the person received the knot, they'd burn it so that the Spanish couldn't find it. Now, I thought this was amazing because this is what they did in, in Bolivia with, with the, the, the indigenous population fighting against the Spaniards. They did the same thing, you know, yeah. except they'd run miles and miles. So it's, it, it's amazing. Uh, those type of historical facts, which I really wish more, most people would know, but, but we'll have to, we have some work to do before we get there. Yeah. yeah. And, and thank you, uh, Kathleen. She just put the gun on Dag. I couldn't remember the name. That that's that's the link to the organization. It's a wonderful place, and I, lo I love supporting them. Oh yeah, Ganondigan, Yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah. That, I, I've been there. It's really an amazing place. It, it, it is, you know, and yeah. um, it's 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 just wonderful and good yeah. people, you know. And I see some of the, the work that they do and the stone they, they carve the carvings, and it's just it's just amazing. But for me, like I said, I have an MA in history. I, I, I love history, and so I always learn something from them. It's, it's, it's yeah, Ganondigan, you know, that's uh, it's, it's uh, supposed to be the city of peace, you know, in uh, Seneca language, Seneca, yeah. city of peace. And the reason why they call it that, because, you know, the peacemaker, when the peacemaker came, um, the first person to believe and to have faith in him was the woman. And I can't remember her name, but... <laughs> It's, it's in Seneca language, but uh, anyway, that was her, that Ganonigan was, was where she was from. And so then uh, that uh, the title that she, that she carried, that, you know, that she established, it, it, it continued on. So then that's always been known as a city of peace. But um, interestingly, if you study the New York history, you see George Washington knew these things. That's why when he uh, was trying to destroy the Haudenosaunee, he burned down, he, he ransacked the city of peace. I think three times he tried to destroy it. He just, he actually he did destroy it. So that's why the uh, Haudenosaunee, they call uh, George Washington, his title is destroyer of civilization. Here we go. <laughs> well, I think they had a lot in common with the English because the British had them listed yeah. as a terrorist until just yeah. like a decade ago. So. Yeah. So they, that's what they call me. I think the, it's, he's known by various names. They call him either the, the village burner or the destroyer of civilizations. So <laughs> he's got his, uh, he's infamous. <laughs> yeah, I'd <laughs> say there. Would be, of yeah. course. <laughs> <laughs> but he was very, you know, he was a strategist. He knew how to. How to really get, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, next thing, uh, Kevin, if, uh, I'd like to see if you could talk a little bit about the um, your, the project, the GoFundMe project that's called Elevate Standing Rock, the Sioux Tribe Towers. And I'm going to put the link up here in a minute. Could oh, you, thank you. Yeah, could you describe yeah. that, please? Yeah, yeah, well, um, uh, you know, one of the things that we experience in the Northern Plains is uh, is kind of short seasons, and they're very... Uh, you know, they're, they're very, very much, um, you know, potent and, and accentuated, but, uh, uh, you know, like the summertime, it gets really hot. And then of course, transitioning now, but then we have kind of a long period of winter. And so then, uh, what happened, you know, was, uh, uh back in the, in the forties and the fifties, you know, all of our, all of our, um, our paradise was destroyed by, the, the dams that the Army Corps of Engineers put on the Missouri River, because for thousands of years, you know, that was the huge oasis in those river bottoms that, that provided all the, the shelter, the medicines, the fertile soils, everything that people needed to sustain life. 
and there were these huge ecosystems that were all inundated by the, uh, the, the, the projects, you know, to create high hydroelectric power. But uh, in any case, um, what happened was that this, when these, all these lands were, were, were submerged, uh, it created a, a food crisis for the people, nutritional crisis, and it's never been, it's never been solved. It's, it's made the, the people dependent on outside resources for, especially for nutrition. So then uh, what we've been doing is to, and we've got a lot of, a lot of uh, grassroots support is to really bolster the, uh, the production of, of fresh food. And now we have, so we're, we're supporting not, not just these, these tower gardens, but the, all, all of them, but these tower gardens are really good because it's state of the art technology that provides uh, fresh, really wonderful uh, veg nutritious vegetables throughout the year, throughout the winter months as well. And so of course the schools are perfect environment for that because of course you know they have to keep the keep the thermostat at a certain level so that that they can uh, maintain the right temperature and then we then it, it's really it's really a economical system very economical system you get these uh, oops i think he's, he's frozen so we'll We'll wait. Hopefully, it'll come come back in a minute. Uh, anyway, I just I did post a link to his um, fun, GoFundMe site. Whoops! Now I'm disconnected. Enthusiasm for learning, and not only that, but great nutrition for the communities that otherwise uh, are really fresh, you know, vegetables. Yeah, that's well, a great initiative and it's going really good. You have a lot of grassroots support, but we can always use more support so you can get more uh, more towers. You know, Standing Rock, we, we had our, our, our moment in the, in, the, in, the, in the sun there before it went into the black hole of information, you know, during the uh, water protection period uh, four years ago, four years ago, and that was all going on. But yeah, we it's we, we still have we have our communities there, and every life goes on. But we just want to make it better and better, especially for the youth. Yeah. Oh, of course, if you can get the youth involved, that's even yeah. that's even better. Yeah. So uh, that's extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, and I think that that's I think that's it for me. Uh, I don't really have any other questions. I've asked my share. I mean, uh, Kathleen, Joel. Uh, anyone else like to have have a question or any other thoughts, Kevin? Let's see what they have to say. Sure, that's a good thing to share. Yeah. Um, my name is Joan Williams. I'm located in the Chicago area, and um, grew up a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. Spent the last 13 years working with a uh, study abroad provider until COVID came in and um, not our best student, but um, it was very interesting. And I thank you for your time, um, Kevin, for sharing all this information you had. Um, you raise a couple of questions and um, that probably is due to my uh, degree in cultural anthropology, but for international ed and for the current situation it's in right now where students are being held hostage wherever they're at um, until we can get past this pandemic. Um, do you feel that there are lessons that could be taught or shared with students um, that cross the tremendous diversity of indigenous peoples and as you said, their culture, their um, sense of the divine of the ecology and it's it's just such a wealth of information can you see a way that we can impart that to um students who can't right now go abroad or to students from abroad who can't come here yeah that's a really good question yeah i think uh, you know this is part of this upwelling of uh 
you know, these different voices, you know, just like in the US, the, uh, the tip of the spear is the uh, black white issue. So that's the main thing that has to be uh, dealt with. But, you know, even uh, Martin Luther King and the different leaders of thought such as Malcolm X and others during that time in the 60s, you know, they, they a lot of them spoke in the context of this being a, a, a quest or some kind of a movement to re redeem the soul of America, you know, this dealing with the slavery and the black white issue. But Martin Luther King pointed out that really the underlying foundational redemption has to take place in dealing with the indigenous people. <laughs> yeah, he, he brought that up. But he can, he can see now that this indigenous uh, voices are rising up. They're rising up everywhere. Even, even if you try and ignore it or put it down just like that autumn peltier, but it's, it's still coming up and it's uh, that voice is all based on these uh, teachings of these divine messengers that we kind of alluded to mentioned, you know, the spiritual foundation that they laid. And like this, that article of that woman from Ecuador, she, she doesn't mention it specifically, but it's all inspired by that. You can say like this underlying covenant that the people have. And so that voice is, is coming up and you'll see there's, there's several themes that are characteristic of that voice. One of them is the theme of, uh, of uh, they all have to do with, uh, with unity, with spiritual unity. But one of them has to do with uh, the fact that uh, everything, the, the foundation of everything is, uh, is uh, prayer, is spiritual unity. Even if it's just, you know, of course it's, 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 it's ecumenical, it, it transcends all, you know, all kind of spiritual barriers, but it's just this, but everything has to be, I have that spiritual focus. And another one is, another theme you'll see that's a characteristic of this voice is the relatedness of all creation. All of creation is related. Another big theme that you'll see that uh, indigenous people are, are, um, are accentuating is the, uh, uh, is the need to be uh, substance abuse free. Substance abuse free, that's a really big one. Really big one because even though in you know there's a lot of problems with alcoholism and things like that, everybody knows that you can't uh, you if you know like any kind of a substance, it, it's it totally is uh, incompatible with uh, traditional culture. It can't it it go, there's no there's no conciliation at all. There, it's totally separated. So those are those are some of the uh, themes that you'll see in this. Uh, these uh, the uh, indigenous voices that, that are arising now, and one of the probably the, one of the main ones is is the uh, theme of being child centered, child centered, and this is one of the big things you know like especially in New York, the peacemaker emphasized this you know how about about how all the deliberations and consultations have to be about not just the the uh, the unborn, those who are yet unborn, but even thinking into the future, even up to maybe four, how our deliberations, our actions, our consultation affects up to four to seven generations into the future. And not just into the future, but even back in the past, how, it, how what we're doing honors our ancestors. So it's this, uh, these are the themes that you'll see there. They're constantly, brought out. Uh, so what it is, it's kind of an antidote to the materialistic civilization that we see kind of closing in on us all around. So even like in the fires, you know, like I, I saw this, the fires out in California, you know, pe there were some articles I saw that they're looking at the practices of the local people like the Yurok, the Karuk, the different uh, Yokuts, different people's there because they've been there for thousands and thousands of years. And so, you know, they've gone through drought periods and so forth, and they know how to, you know, they're, through experience, they've learned how to manage that and how to, how to live in harmony or in sync with these, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, potentiality for devastating fires. So yeah, they're just simple things that, uh, they, they, that they've learned over time. Yeah, so those are some of the things 
I don't know if I did I did I did I uh, did I kind of divert detour from your <laughs> your question. Um, slightly, but I I feel that there were insights there to apply to. Okay. Um, students, I don't know if anybody else agrees with with that, but I think um, we're looking for ways to engage students to keep them engaged. And we have this wealth of diversity within our own nation that can be shared and that is uniquely cultural mm -hmm. um, and culturally diverse from our um, the majority of our students. So mm -hmm. why not offer that as an option? Yes. That's, so thank you. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Joel, no, no questions? <laughs> well, I, I, I'll have another one. Um, and Kevin, I don't know if you read this book. It was, I think, 2017. It was called, um, how was it now? The, the Killers of the, of the Flower Moon. No, I never heard about that. Oh, David Gann. It was an excellent book. Somehow that book didn't uh, win the best, the book of the year award. But for those of you, um, yeah, it's called The Killers of the, uh, of the Flower Moon, it, it, David Gann, G-A-N-N. -N. And it, it takes place, I think in, in, in uh, Oklahoma, 19, in the 1920s. Uh -huh. Because back then there was a group of indigenous people who owned land that had a lot of oil underneath. It. And we all know what happens once the US government finds out about these type of things. Uh -huh. But it really reads like a mystery, but it's it's actual history. Uh, in fact, I, I'm going to try and uh, I'm going to try and find the, uh, the the link. But that's a very good book to read. He's very well written, very well researched. But more importantly, he's talking about this pe these people whose lives were lost to history. We don't know about them. He, he tried to recover some, uh, but too many people were just not um, were were not counted. But I'm going to I'm going to step away for a minute. And I'm going to find find the um, the, the link. Um, just, just to add to Tom's comment, there was a very good NPR um, interview with the author, I believe. Um, and Kevin, you had mentioned the, um, the sense of child centeredness and the purpose behind the nefarious activity was to, um, they were people wanting the oil were marrying into these indigenous families and then killing off their spouses so that they could not extend their generations any further. I mean, that, yeah, was, yeah. that was a part those, of it. Uh, the head rights, the head rights. It, that's, yeah. that's the Osage yes. tribe in around Pahuska. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Hmm. So a very good, very good, um, historical background on there. I can try and look for that link. I'll try and post it. I just posted a link to the uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. But like I said, that's a very, very well-written book. Oh. I finished that, like, I think in four days. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's it, like I said, it reads like a mystery murder, but th this has actually happened. And it's yeah. not mentioned in the, in the US history books. No. So I think for that alone, David Grant should have received some kind of recognition, and I think that's uh, and he didn't, and that that's a shame. But it's a very good book if you can read it. Uh -huh. thank you for that. Thank you. Sure. No, another another book I read, and you, maybe you know this, Kevin, is um called uh, "The Death of James Loney." Have you heard of that? I think I've heard of it, but I haven't read it. No. Yeah, that's a that's absolutely a depressing book. Uh, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll I'll put that link up here for any of you who want to read this and. And if you may ask, you know, why, Tom, how have you been able to read all these books? Well, I was unemployed for about 25 months, two, two long periods of unemployment. So I did a lot of reading. But uh, when, I made, when I read this book, I had no idea. I mean, I should have, but the title is The Death of James Loney. So, you know, it didn't end well. But yeah. it, it's it basically, it's, it's about, um, where was he? I think New Mexico. And he just basically gives up on life. It's all a spiral down. Uh, oh, th thank you, Joan, for for uh, for posting that link, the NPR link, uh, and it's it's a it's a very um, and James Welsh, he, he is Native American, but and he passed yeah. away years ago, but he captured the essence, the desperation in this case of this character, mm -hmm. um, and it was uh, that's 
it had been a long time since a book really impacted me like this one did. So I'm just going to write the title here and you guys can uh, look it up. But um, very, 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 very good book. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, Alex, it's, I, I like to read. Like I said, when you're unemployed for a while, it's, it's a lot of reading. <laughs> yeah. So, it's, well, the other thing, too, just on, the, on a, another note, I used to, I like to play racquetball, but I hadn't, up until about a month ago, I hadn't been able to play racquetball. So I put on yeah. some weight, unfortunately. So it's yeah. a good thing oh. you can only see me from my upper torso up because uh, <laughs> I have work to do, unfortunately. So. <laughs> Yeah, um, thanks to COVID, I think a lot of people are losing the battle with the bones. Oh, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's, it's tough. It, it yeah. is tough. Um, any any other questions? I think let's see, um, Kathleen, Celia, and I have to. I I want to thank Celia because it's it's late. It's like nine o'clock where she's in she's in France, so she's joining us from oh, wow. there. Six hours away. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Appreciate thank it. Thank you for the presentation. I mean, it was really interesting. I think it's it also highlights partially how each country or society really um, take control of uh, takes control of the narrative and just kind of changes how they picture what happened mm -hmm. according to well what suits them best. Um, and a lot of populations have suffered from it and a lot of truth are hidden and it's, uh, I think it's really sad and, um, I mean, it's 2020, <laughs> 2020, there's the internet and still, I think mm -hmm. there's so much is still hidden, um, and that, um, I hope one day we will know about. Because it deserves like those people, everyone like when when their truth has been hidden. I mean, they they really deserve uh, people to know what truly happened. Right. Just, um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, so, if uh, if uh, no one has any questions, I uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Appreciate your time and, and your insight and your experience and your thoughts. Um, and, and this was a very good session. I think this this was this was just nice to, to talk about these type of things and just learn a little bit more. For me, I always like and learning a lot, and it's it, it's it's always a pleasure. Very good. Okay, thank you. Thanks okay. for hosting this, Tom. It's great, and I wish you a lot of uh, success and everything. And uh, look forward to staying in touch. Oh, absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, Kevin, and thank, thank you, you everyone else for All right. joining thank us. You. Bye, everybody. Thanks thank so you. Much. Take care. Stay well. Thank you. Bye.